Welcome, James. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time for being here today. It's really nice to get to know you more and uh, to learn more to learn more about you, your life story. Although I know many people already know you <laughs> from the community, but uh, great to have you today. So James, for those who don't yet uh, know you, would you mind sharing a little bit about uh, who, who like you are and what you do? Oh yes, absolutely. So my name is James Hayden. I live in New Orleans, Louisiana in the United States. Uh, I work as a HLA technologist. So what that means is I see if a potential organ donor and a potential organ recipient are compatible. So we do all the testing for pre and post transplant patients. Um, I'm also a brother, I'm a son, I'm a friend, I'm a writer, I'm a fan of the show Survivor, I'm a fan of the World Saints, and I'm also a person who, who stutters. And up until a few years ago, that was something I could not say to myself, much less to anyone else. I truly understand how 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 that feels. It's not easy, but I really like how you like introduce yourself as everything. And then the last thing that you mentioned is like stuttering. Rather than making it the first thing about you, you made it the last thing. So there are so many other aspects of you that should be uh that should be highlighted so that's really cool i love that exactly thank you yeah i've just come to i guess realize over the past few years or so that i think stuttering is just like it's just like a fun fact about myself it's one of those things that like make me uniquely me and it's honestly like one of the least interesting things about myself but it's just a topic a lot of people know me for my stuttering which years ago it's not something i would ever be okay with but now i've come to be okay with that fact and people know me for stuttering okay, cool, but there's way more cooler things that I've done or that are me than just this little uh, stuttering thing. Yeah. And this is a topic because now you are talking about like acceptance and this is, and this is a topic I will go back to, but how did the stuttering impact your life? Uh, and when did you realize that you speak a little bit differently than others? How was that? Yeah, so I first began stuttering around the age of like three, four, five years old. Uh, and for context, I'm 30. I just turned 30 last month. And yes, I know I look like I'm 20, like at most. I know I have a baby face. It's cool. That's a blessing. Believe me. <laughs> that's what I've been told. That's what that's what everyone tells me that like be glad that I look like a high school student when I'm 30 years old. But anyway, so I started studying around the age like three, four, five. But um, I really didn't know that I was a person who stutters until maybe 10, 11, 12. Maybe younger, I'm not exactly sure. When I was in speech therapy, you know, no one really told me, hey, James, you started, this is what it means. Um, I just knew that I talked differently than the rest of the kids in my class. And as a result, I got to leave school early to go to speech therapy. But it wasn't until maybe 8, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in that ballpark that I realized, oh, I stutter. And then it wasn't until I was in my 20s where I learned, oh, this is what that means. This is the pros and the cons and the fears, doubts, and insecurities, all that, which we can get into later. But as far as impacting my life, I try to not let it impact me. I try, keyword try, and I don't always succeed at this. I try just to live my life full, to the fullest, fluency be damned. Now, are there times when I let my stutter prevent me from doing something? Yes, if I'm being honest, yes. But there are more times when I do something regardless of the fact that I'm gonna stutter or not. If I do, fantastic. If I don't, fantastic. If I've learned anything over the past like few years, I've learned that my stutter or being a person who stutters has made me more empathetic. It's made me a better listener. It's helped me to see people for who they are, for how I want them to be. And I like to think I'm a better person because I'm a person who stutters. I've experienced things and met so many people who I would not have met otherwise if I wasn't a part of this community. So that right there alone is, makes it worth it. That sounds super cool. 
And uh, how was your like acceptance journey? Because you seem to be, yes, it was difficult for some time for you, but you kind of came, or not kind of like you came to terms with it and you are very like uh, open about your like stutter. How was your journey of self, of self, self acceptance? Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's an ongoing journey. And I don't think I will ever be finished with this journey of acceptance until I'm six feet under, honestly. Um, it's a choice. It's a choice daily and it's a choice hourly to be okay with this part of myself, to talk about this part of myself. There are times when I want nothing to do with this. I don't want to talk about it or be okay with it. And that's fair. I think that's valid. It's okay to not be okay in that regard of not wanting to do anything with it. But my whole, I guess, journey to acceptance probably started when I was in, when I was 20, when I was back in speech therapy. I stopped going to speech therapy when I was 11 or 12. And then I went again as a college student because uh, my stutter was becoming more pronounced and severe. And uh, for a variety of reasons, just decided to go back for, for speech therapy. And when I originally went back, my goal was to not stutter. Like fluency was the end all be all. And if I wasn't fluent, if I didn't walk out there fluent, then it was a failure as far as I'm concerned, as far as I was concerned. But it was going to speech therapy as a junior and a senior in college and having many conversations with my speech therapist and really actually talking about stuttering for the first time in my life, of talking about my fears and my doubts and my insecurities and all of just the, the negative stuff that's underneath the iceberg of stuttering. And it was actually talking about that and hashing that kind of stuff out and just being upfront with, with myself and with my therapist about all, all that comes with being a person who stutters. And through those conversations over a two year span, I realized that stuttering wasn't the worst thing in the world. It may be like the top 10 worst things in the world, but it's not number one, you know? And so once I graduated college, I so I graduated in 2015, I moved to a new city for my first job out of college. Didn't know anyone except for my best friend and my cousin. The only people I knew in the city, I knew my coworkers, but outside of that, not a lot going on. And I uh, got involved with the NSA, which is the National Studying Association here in the States. And it was being involved in that group. I've been involved in that group now for almost seven and a half years at this point closing on eight years, where I met people that got it, who understood, who who like truly got what it means to be a person who stutters. And being a part of that community of being people who inspire me, who challenge me, and who get it, that has helped me on my on my own journey. And I think also just growing up and getting older, realizing there's more important things to worry about than if it takes me an extra five, 10, 20 seconds to say my name or to say my order at Starbucks or to call the insurance person about an issue I have. Like there's more important things going on in the world. So that's helped me. But it's remind myself to make that choice daily and at times are. And there are times when stuttering, I mean stuttering sucks 24-7, 365, I'm not gonna lie. But it's choosing to see, it's choosing to be okay with that and it's choosing to see the good that stuttering has brought. Because if I didn't, if I would just be mad about this, then and stuttering wins. And stuttering would hold me back from like living. And what's the point of that? I agree. I agree. It's a daily choice and it really requires sometimes a big uh, effort. But it's so important to try to shift the focus from like a stuttering, from making it our everything, our entire life, and just shifting the focus to minimize it in the sense that you know is there, you can't control all the time, um, mm -hmm. and you just have to learn how to live with it, right? So you right. just you have to choose to learn with it. Um, I find it super cool. And the one thing that I wanted to 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 mention is that you have uh, written a book on oh. like, which I have read. Yes, if you want to show the world, I stutter. Available on, on uh, Kindle, Amazon, and BarnesandNobles.com. Yes. 
Super cool. And you also wrote several like uh, articles on this topic of like stuttering. You participated in many podcasts. What motivated you to start getting to start getting involved in the stuttering community and becoming a stuttering a stuttering advocate? Okay, so I kind of fell into this thing backwards. Uh, so it all started around this time seven years ago when I was at, at my dream, I was a step below my dream job at my dream company. I use the words a dream job and dream company in air quotes, if you're just listening to, to the audio version of this. Um, I was at this job that I hated and I was beyond miserable. I, I had a job in my field four months after graduating college, which is like unheard of. Like I'm very aware of how unheard of that is. I like got what I thought I wanted four months after graduating college. And a year, I think I woke up on my one year anniversary of that job. And I said, if I'm here for the rest of my life, something went terribly wrong. That was in September of 2016. By February of 2017, um, I knew I needed to get out of there for just my own mental health. Great people who do great work, it just wasn't a good fit for me. So if any of those people are listening, it's all good. Uh, so I realized I didn't know what my next step was, but I knew it had to involve happiness in some capacity because I was miserable at this job. So I started uh started in i uh was a panel uh, I, I was part of a panel for an nsa open house of my local chapter and i talked about stuttering very openly with to a room full of strangers which me back then six seven years ago would never have done that sounded like a terrible idea why would i do this and around the same time i guest lectured to the local university's affluency class and through those two events, I realized that I like to talk about stuttering and that it was very cathartic for me, which was ironic because for so long I had ran away from this topic. Like I wouldn't need to talk about anything but stuttering. We talk about stuttering. Nope. I shut down. We are not having that conversation. But I was like, oh, this is like cathartic and I somewhat enjoy doing this. Maybe this could be a way to get myself out of my current job. So I, uh, started to write, I figured, let me at least get my story out there and we'll just see what happens. So I published my story up until that point uh, for The Mighty. That got picked up in um, August. It picked, I picked up like around this time, uh, six years ago. Yeah, six years ago. Uh, so did that, got some great feedback from it, continued to write just to get my name out there and to develop some profile and thinking maybe some point down the line, I could make a living off of this. And as I was writing stuff out there, I got uh, more feedback, a, a more positive feedback. And I enjoy, and I realized that I enjoyed writing, which is uh, something that I'd, I'd always been told I was a good writer, but I only wrote for school and the occasional thank you note. Um, writing about myself was a topic I never wanted to do because that meant I had to like look at myself and take a hard look at myself and be honest and be vulnerable and be emotional with myself, which James at 24, James at 23 did not want to do. was not, it was not his idea of fun, but I decided, you know what, let me just write and see what happens. So I wrote, got good feedback. And the more I re re realized that I like this and the more I wrote, the more I realized, Hey, a lot of these topics that I want to write about could be in the form of an open letter. And then they could be in the form of a book that I may write like five, 10 years down the line if this ever happens. Like this was a hypothetical, what if may never happen, but if it does, I have content. So I spent the summer of 2017, basically just writing stuff, writing to continue to get my name out there in the studying world, to get my name more well-known. And I wrote for this hypothetical book that I figured would probably never happen because write a book, me? No, I'm not gonna happen. So that was pretty much the summer of 2017, nights and weekends were just spent writing uh, for this hypothetical book and to keep my name out there. And then in October of 2017, 
I was fired from that job, uh, which looking back was one of the best things that ever happened because we would not be having this conversation otherwise. But in the moment, it really sucked. Not going to lie. Really sucked to get to, to be fired, but it's all good. I've moved on. Um, and so I was fired. I uh, didn't really have any job prospects lined up, moved in with my parents. And my biggest decision of the day was like, what episode of Survivor, what episode of Survivor am I going to watch today? That was my biggest life decision. And that was fun for like three days. And then it's like, oh, dear God, I need to do something with my life. So uh, it was job hunting, trying to figure out what I'm, what I'm going to do. And then in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, I have this idea for a book. I have nothing going on with my life why not? Like, what's the worst that can happen, you know? And I wanted to try and fail at this whole book thing, as opposed to not try and then wonder what if, what if I did this when I was 40, 50 years old? So I spent the next six weeks or so just writing, editing, and formatting, writing, editing, formatting, writing, editing, and formatting everything. And on a Monday, December 4th, 2017, I self-published uh, Dear What I Stutter on Amazon. On, on, on Amazon, And then things took off way faster than I expected. Um, I thought, I may sell a few copies of this. If it doesn't work out, at least I tried. Did not happen. Uh, within 13 months, it was being used at a university as a required resource. Uh, and since then, it's been listed as a recommended resource under re by uh, many study organizations across the country, required reading at numerous universities, guest lectured all over the United States, presented at a couple of conferences, and things that I thought would take five years to happen only took months. Did the podcast thing, did the writing thing, and what was just like an attempt to figure out what my next step was blew up way quicker than I ever thought it would, which is a great thing and also was not a great thing. And we can get into that later. But yeah, that's how I got into this, stumbled into it. Was it difficult to get published or it was easy for you? No, it was easy. Uh, Amazon is great. They have, or Amazon Corporation, there's issues we know, but uh, their self-publishing program was pretty straightforward. Uh, they had like a template you could use and I did everything on my own. So they just, uh, they just print the books for me and then give me some money afterwards. Super. That's really, really cool. I, I can only imagine how nice it is to have your own book in your hands and selling to people all over the world. I mean, I am, uh, I am based in Belgium and I bought, mm -hmm. you know, and I bought your, your, your book online. And you are in the US, so your book is being read all over the world, which is really cool. Congratulations for that. Thank you. And it's also a really weird feeling. Like, like this this thing that I this thing that I did when I had no idea what I'm doing with my life developed something way bigger than I could ever imagine. Five and a half years later since I published it's still really wild and crazy for me to think about. Like the impact that that it 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 has had, is having and will continue to have. Do you have any plans to maybe write another book or something like that? Um, I thought about it recently, but right now I'm not in that place. Uh, let's just say never say never, but not right now. In your years of uh, talking about like stuttering, what has been the biggest lesson that you have learned and why? Ooh, there's a there's a lot. Uh, but I think it's the importance of giving grace to ourselves and to others. Because a lot of people don't know what they don't know about stuttering. You know, and sometimes they'll say something or they'll do something that they think is super helpful because their resource, their knowledge base is very limited. And so they're doing what they believe is best, even if it's not the best thing. It's coming from a well-intentioned place. So it's to realize that, hey, they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They think they're doing the right thing. Acknowledge that, but also educate them on how to be better. But also grace for myself when there are days when I don't want to be an advocate, where I just allow that, that negative experience to happen and I don't address it. Because in that moment, I just don't want to deal with stuttering. I just want to get what I'm, get what I'm there for. 
and move on. I don't want to deal with it. So to give myself grace for the days where I don't choose to advocate or the moments I don't choose to advocate. So just the overall importance of, of grace, whether for myself or for others, that's the big thing. And setting boundaries, which we can get into later. Perfect. Perfect. And um, what would you advise those who are currently struggling with self-acceptance and who have a hard time dealing with their with their stutter? What would you tell them? It's gonna one, it's it's okay to stutter straight up. It's gonna be okay. You're on your own journey. Your journey is good, it's valid, it's beautiful. And you're going to reach acceptance, however you define acceptance, in your own time and in your own way. There's no guidebook on this. There's no like, oh, by the age of 31, you need to be fully accepting of your stutter. No, there's no such thing as that. You're on your own journey. Your journey is good. Your journey is beautiful. And your journey is valid. And there's a whole entire community there to help you with your journey. And that it's okay to stutter. This isn't this doesn't define you, but you define it. It's just one unique thing that makes you uniquely you. It's not a dragon to be slayed or something to be embarrassed by, but rather a fun fact about yourself. And you'll see that in your own way and in your own time. That's a great uh, message, to be honest, because I think sometimes we like struggle so much to go through mm -hmm. this journey and just accept as much as possible because again it's a journey that can last a lifetime right it never ends <laughs> for some exactly it lasts longer for some people uh it will never happen maybe they will never come to terms uh, with it but um i think it, it's is important to try accept everything that we are and the way that we that that we are on the things that we cannot change right because otherwise mm -hmm keep suffering constantly because we can't change something and i think one of the points that probably is stress a lot of people who like stutter is how others perceive us because everyone wants to feel accepted and loved and everything and i think the fear of being rejected also because of the speech impediment can be something that also makes us sometimes struggle more or less to like accept and to and to deal with it so that's a great exactly. thing. yeah and something i've i have learned over the past few years is like like i know i care more about the fact that i stutter than like basically anyone else that like i talked on a regular basis people in my life don't care it's a non-issue and that's why they're in my life if they did care if they didn't make an issue they wouldn't be in my life so those who like truly love you and truly care for you the fact that you stutter should be a non-issue for them. Like it's a non-issue for like everyone in my life. I care the most about it. The first person to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think uh, definitely we should we should really surround ourselves with people that support us, that love us. Mm -hmm. But we also know that unfortunately there is a lot of misconception about like stuttering, and people have little idea, not to say zero idea. <laughs> what is stuttering so what would you like people to know about like stuttering mm -hmm. stuttering one it's okay to stutter but stuttering is just like this little communication thing it may take a few extra seconds to say our name or say our coffee order or whatever but we are just as capable as you are we can we're we're not lying we're not nervous we're not excited you know we're smart we know what we're doing we know what we're talking about we can we are still people we want to be loved and to be known. It just may take us a few extra seconds, but we are just like you. Everyone has their the, everyone has their thing. Everyone has their own vulnerability, the thing they're not really confident about or, or secure enough about. But ours just happens to introduce itself to you sometimes before we can introduce ourselves to you. But... That's great. That's great. And um, you took some time off from public speaking, talking about like stuttering. Um, was there any, any, specific, any specific reason uh, that you would like to share with us? Yeah, so how early when I was talking about my book and like studying advocacy and all that, things took off way quicker than I thought they would, which was a great thing. 
because like my my book was out there and it has like this has this massive impact and how it wasn't a great thing and I struggled a lot with my mental health uh it started August of 2021 I, I like was like starting to feel burnout but I didn't know if it was because of this is if it was because of my current job if it was other stuff like what's what's really going on and the it just kind of progressed and progressed to fall of 2021 I was starting to feel guilty if I didn't spend part of my weekends writing stuff I felt this constant pressure to be on to be on all the time to be what I call the brand which is this very charismatic and outgoing extrovert version of me who is who believes that stuttering is a great thing and yay stuttering and all that good stuff so I was getting burnt out on that I was getting burnt out on having to like schedule trying to schedule like entire semesters worth of guest lectures to get that get, get that in with personal stuff and work obligations um I was just the point where I wasn't recognizing myself I could the James the person and James the brand which I want to keep at arm's length from each other were now blending in and I was starting to not recognize myself I was starting to feel guilty if I said no to um, a writing thing or to a guest lecture I try to make it work. I was, was like, no, I need to do this. I need to do this. And it was at the cost of my own mental health. And what did it for me was I was uh, listening to myself back uh, for a guest lecture interview thing I did. And I said something and I thought, wow, I wish I believed that. And in that moment, I knew I needed to take a massive step back. I fulfilled my obligations. But yeah, I spent about six, seven months of saying no to guest lectures, saying no to uh, saying no to podcasts, not writing anything for studying related causes unless I felt like I had to, which I felt there was like one or two articles like, oh, I, I want to write this thing is out there. But I just took this massive hiatus to focus on myself, focus on my mental self and figure out who is James the person outside of this whole James the brand studying advocate thing. Because I was starting to not recognize who, who's James this person. Because everyone knows James the brand. And I was starting to not recognize myself. I was starting to let the brand take over my personal life. Just take over who, who I am. And it's like, I'm not doing this. I took a step back. And I was at the point of, if I never write another article again, if I never do another podcast, guest lecture, interview like this, I'll be okay. Because I just did not recognize myself. I needed to figure out who am I apart from all of this advocacy brand stuff. And if I never do it again, I'll be okay. But was and, the, uh, sorry, James, what was the main thing about yourself that you couldn't recognize? Was that one specific thing? They were like, okay, this is really not me. Because I noticed a lot of like my social media stuff was becoming more, it was less of me and more like stuttering stuff and very much like less of who I am. I felt like as my head it goes, went to like a stuttering meeting. I had to be like on, I had to be the brand, I had to be like, yay, stuttering, because that's what everyone knew me as. Um, and I don't remember what exact thing that I said, but I it was, I was just like listening to myself back for an interview I did. And I don't remember the exact words, but I just remember thinking, I wish I believed that, whatever it was. And that was my cue of, yeah, it's it's time. Uh, the fact that I felt guilty for not writing, the fact that I would like try to reorganize my entire schedule two, three times a year to fit all of guest lectures and work and make it things hard on myself just to just for like the brain to like not let people down and it's like no I need to look out for myself right now I need to take a step back and focus on me and the people who who want me to do the, the podcast and the lectures they they'll understand so I was very open about it to, to some people it's like look I need time off I'm not doing it it's not you it's me I need to figure out who who, who am I as a, as a human outside of all this and if I never do it again will I be okay 
And yeah, I would be okay. And it's taught me how we, I mentioned what is this whole advocacy thing taught you is boundaries, the importance of boundaries. Like I'm not saying yes to, to everything anymore. I'm very selective because it's not worth the cost of my mental health. I, if I can make it happen, I'll make it happen. But if not, if I, I, I won't. Um, I learn with writing, it's better for me to write only maybe two or three great solid articles every year, as opposed to writing 12 okay-ish articles. Um, I won't even be more intentional with what I do, whether it's my, my writing or my interviews or whatever. And I was talking to a friend about this during, right, he's, he's like the height of, of my break over the summer. And she said, um, advocacy is not something you check off of your box. Advocacy is something you live. So my new way now is just to live a, live a life that shows it's okay to stutter. I don't need to do 20 interviews a year and do 30 guest lectures and write 15 articles. If I just show, if I live a life that shows it's okay to stutter, and that's enough. And if I write a couple articles or do an interview or two, then so be it. That's just the cherry on top. But yeah. just live a life that, that shows it's okay to stutter. I think that's the best way to, that I can advocate right now. I think sometimes we can have a lot of like pressure. If you start, if people start to get to know you as someone who accepted stuttering and you're always talking about it, um, trying to like encourage other people, then you feel that people expect a lot. They always expect you to be in this positive vibe about the stuttering, about yourself, about you know everything. And sometimes mm -hmm. I can imagine it can be very overwhelming because we are all human beings. At the end of like the day, we also have days that we're feeling pretty bad about it. And there are days that we are fine. And there are days that we're confident. There are days that we are not confident. And that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But I know that it can be very challenging if you always have to be the person who is always encouraging others, always positive about like stuttering. So yeah, I think it was. It was, it was a lot. And I need, and I need that time off just for everything. And now I'm in a place where I, I feel comfortable again doing this not to a grand scale maybe do one or two guest lectures a, a semester as opposed to like six to eight ten that I was doing just be selective with what I want to do and there's other things I want to do and other ways I can advocate without doing all the big things the, the, the little things are just as important and what would you tell the 10 year old James if you could go back in time wow about that. So this is um well my opening letters is a letter to my 10-year-old self. Let me find it. Uh, um just remember one thing. You always were, always are, and always will be so much more than your stutter. I know you may not I know you may not see that now, but in time you will. Trust me. That's a great advice. It's a great thing to tell yourself as a ten, as a as a ten year old. Do you think back then you would have understood this message well, or you think you wouldn't have really processed in the way that you meant for it to be? Ooh, that's a really that's a really great question. No one's ever asked me that. Um, I think ten year old me would not have told thirty year old me telling him that. 10 year old me didn't have the emotional maturity to like handle something like that. 10 year old, 10 -year -old me were like, I talk different than the rest of the kids. I don't want to do this. This sucks. No, like get rid of this. This is nonsense. What are you saying, dude? No. And um, is there any, well, you mentioned that you don't know yet about any future projects. If you have any future projects on writing or you are taking it easy. Is there any message, anything that you would like to send to people who like stutter, but also people who don't, you know, stutter? Something that you think would be a final message to wrap it up? Yeah, I mean, so the only upcoming project I have is I'll be at the NSA conference in July. That's about all I have going on. I don't, I just kind of do when I write when it comes up. I don't force anything anymore. But as far as a closing message, um, for those, for thank you for listening. Uh, for those who don't stutter, um, best thing to do is be an ally and let the person that you're talking to who stutters, let them lead the way on how they want you to handle their stutter. Everyone's an expert on their own stutter. Um, and 
follow their lead. Something that's been great with my family and friends is that they follow my lead on how I want to or not want to talk about stuttering. And the, ever since I was ever since I was little, they were really great about that. So just let the person in your life who stutters know that, that you're there for them in any in any capacity and how however they need you and let them guide you. People who stutter, it's okay to stutter. It's okay to stutter. It's okay to stutter. Uh, something I wish I heard as a kid. So I'm very, very insistent on saying that message. But you're on your own journey. It's a good, beautiful, and valid journey. And you have a whole community who is here to help you on that journey. It doesn't define you, but you define it. It's just one small part of, the thing, of what makes you uniquely you. Amen to that. That's a great message. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, James. It's a pleasure to to talk to you. Um, I get why you have been invited so many times to talk because you're a great speaker. You're a Thank great you. talker. Uh, you're very inspiring. You're very encouraging. You have a positive vibe about you, which is really cool. Great talking to you. Great talking as well. Thank you for having me. Work. Thank you so much. Thank Keep you. in touch. Will do. Have a good one. Bye-bye.